Good morning, students. Today we will talk about the formation of the body cavities, the diaphragm, and the serous membranes. Uh, here we have some terms, and you have to, it has to be clear what these terms exactly mean. So we have three serous membranes, like the pleura, the pericardium, and the peritoneum. These are the serous membranes. Each of these has a visceral and a parietal plate. Between these two plates, we have a cavity that we call the pleural cavity, the pericardial cavity, and the peritoneal cavity. Please, make, uh, uh, please uh, be aware of that, that we have to make a difference between the thoracic cavity and the thoracic cage. Uh, the thoracic cavity, uh, that's the territory above the diaphragma, and it exceeds the level of the first ribs with two centimeters. That's, that, that's the cupola pleurae, and that's together this whole uh, territory. That's the thoracic cavity. And the highest point of the uh, diaphragm that reflects to the anterior body wall at the level of the fifth, vertebra, uh, fifth uh, uh, rib. So it's much higher than you usually think. And uh, the thoracic cage is the actual territory uh, which is bordered by the ribs, the sternum, and the uh, vertebral column. And this uh, thoracic cage gives also partially the wall of the abdominal cavity, especially in the, in the uh, higher regions. Uh, like you know that the uh, liver usually doesn't hang out from under the ribs. So the liver territory of the abdominal cavity is also bordered by the ribs. And on the other side, uh, we have the fundus of the stomach and we have also the spleen. So be aware of these cavities, please. Now, the, uh, the basics of all these uh, uh, happenings, what we will discuss today, is the folding. Uh, I hope you remember it from the previous semester that I showed you the gloves and I pushed out my two fingers. And with this, we got in the longitudinal aspect of the folding. Uh, we have a head process and a tail process. And if we follow the transversal uh, happenings of the foldings, uh, here you see a trilaminar germ disc. This is the ectoderm. In the middle here, we will have the neural plate, uh, the notochord, the endoderm. In, in between the two major layers, here laterally, we have also the mesoderm. As the neural plate uh, thickens and elevates, parallelly with that also the paraxial mesoderm, uh, will uh, thicken and also in the lateral plate mesoderm here holes will appear and as the folding proceeds these holes will fuse, will, will form a cavity. This will be here the intraembryonic salome and initially this intraembryonic salome is widely connected to the extraembryonic salome. So the two are not yet separated from each other. Meanwhile as you see also the neural tube closed and the surface ectoderm uh, that covers now the, the skin ectoderm covers the surface on the ector, uh, ectodermal side and in the mesoderm we have now the paraxial mesoderm with the somites and the intermediate mesoderm but the lateral plate mesoderm two plates the visceral and the parietal plate they, they uh, parietal layer they border a cavity which we call now the intraembryonic salome so this is here the intraembryonic salome this is here the extraembryonic salome Right? These are yet widely communicating with each other. And here you have to watch these two terms because this layer of the, of the intraembryonic mesoderm is called also somatopleura and this layer is called uh, splanchnopleura. And these layers are continuous with the extraembryonic uh, layer. So this is here the extraembryonic somatopleura and the extraembryonic splanchnopleura. There is no sharp border between these two territories, as there is no sharp border between the intraembryonic and extraembryonic salome. As the folding happens, and if we make a transverse cut in the, at the level of the midgut, then we may see the connection between uh, the forming gut system and the yolk sac. This is the vitello-intestinal duct here. And on the surface of the yolk sac, here you have the uh, extraembryonic splanchnopleura. Here you have the intraembryonic splanchnopleura. Please remember that from this intraembryonic splanchnopleura, we get all layers in the uh, intestinal tract, except for the inner lining and the glands. So all the uh, connective tissues, smooth muscle elements, surface uh, mesothelial tissue that comes from this layer. But here at the level of the umbilicus, this is continuous now with the extraembryonic 
splanchnopleura, as the intraembryonic somatopleura is continuous with the extraembryonic splanchnopleura, which is covering the amnion, and as with the folding, the amnion will pull down onto the uh, vitello-intestinal duct. Uh, these two layers, these two mesodermal layers, they will get near to each other. Initially, there is yet a gap here, so the intraembryonic salome is continuous with the extraembryonic salome, but later these two blue layers will fuse with each other, and these will give the Wharton's jelly, that special connective tissue with high amorphous ground substance, which is uh, the tissue in the umbilical cord, and it allows the movement of the umbilical cord, but uh, it prevents the closure of the vessels upon the movements of the baby. Okay. Now, uh, imagine that we have the trilaminar germ disc at the end of the third week, and the heart primordium is, for, uh, is forming. This is the uh, heart tube, the forming heart tube, and here I model this with a play dough. This would be here the bucopharyngeal membrane, about at this level, and around uh, the forming neural plate, and before the bucopharyngeal membrane, inside the embryo, there is a tube forming. Initially, we have these separated blood islands, but as they will fuse, they will form uh, the heart tube. As the folding happens, then the bucopharyngeal membrane that will move forward, and this anterior territory will bend under with this U-shape of the tube. Right? This is now the heart tube, what I'm trying to model you with the Play-Doh. And uh, we, uh, parallelly with the folding, these two parts, the, the two parts of this U-shape, will get close to each other, and they will fuse. And you end up with this shape that you have as, the, uh, as a drawing from the primitive heart tube in your books. This is pretty similar to that, that so this is now uh, fused here. The veins will find the venous end. These will make here the uh, sinus venosus. And on the other two sides, we have the aortic sacs and the ascending aorta. Now, let's take the same Play-Doh tube, right? But now only the red line models uh, the position of the heart tube, because as you see, this heart tube is forming right next to the intraembryonic salome. So now imagine that this Play-Doh uh, worm, that is the intraembryonic salome, and on, on, uh, close to it, we have also the heart tube, which is forming also a U-shape. If the folding happens, then not only the heart tube will bend under, but also the uh, intraembryonic salome. If we make a cut here, and we cut out this territory of the U, intraembryonic salome, then we get one single pericardium, and as you follow the, this, uh, uh, Play-Doh worm, then you can understand that we get two pleuras, and in the distal region they will unite and they will give you one uh, single peritoneal cavity. Uh, you have a series uh, of pictures like this in your book. I would like if you understood this. So here you have now the ectoderm, the neural plate, the notochord, the paraxial mesoderm, lateral plate mesoderm, intraembryonic salome. Next to the intraembryonic salome, here you have the prim primitive heart tube with the myoepicardial plate in the visceral mesoderm, which will give uh, the heart muscle. The lower, lowest layer here, that's the endoderm. Right? So if we make a cross section at this level, then we will, make it, we, we will get twice here the uh, heart primordium on both sides. As it tends to bend under, like here, right? Then we will get twice here these heart tubes, and we get here the dorsal aortas. So uh, you have to know that the dorsal aortas, they develop independently, and only through the aortic arches they will be connected to the forming heart. But now we have here the heart uh, primordium and the dorsal aortas. Then these will get closer to each other, and finally they will unite. Meanwhile, the endoderm, the position of the endoderm will also change, so the endoderm pulls into the body of the baby and will form a deadened tube, which ends anteriorly by the level of the bucopharyngeal membrane. So this is the formation of the heart tube, which forms then parallelly, changes the position parallelly with the intraembryonic salome. 
just a brief uh, remembering that how the heart develops. So this is that uh, heart, primitive heart tube model that I showed you on the previous uh, slides without any coloring. So here you have the sinus venosus, the common atrium, the common ventricle, and the bulbous cordis territory. And from here then the ascending aorta, as the aortic sacs uh, will grow further. As the tube grows, it doesn't have enough space, but the baby needs uh, nutrition and the heart has to uh, function. So it grows faster than the, uh, than the entire size of the baby. So the venous end will bend behind the arterious end. If I pull forward these two pieces, then you, you can imitate the position of the auricles of the heart on both sides. And if you look at this model, then you can see that the heart is in adult also yet a tube. So the blood flows in from the back, it goes to the ventricles and it flows out ventrally. Uh, you have the imagination, as in kindergarten, you had the imagination that the heart has a heart shape. Uh, but uh, of course, now you know that the heart is not heart shape, but you still think that it's kind of like an oval uh, three dimensional structure. If you look at the exact structure and the flow of the blood, then you can realize that it's still a tube. The level of the of the valves, which are positioned at this level, here and here. So here between the common atria and the ventricle, here between the ven ventricles and the uh, pulmonary trunk and the aorta. So these openings are, are held together by the annulus fibrosus. But if we disregard the annulus fibrosus, then the heart is still a tube because the, all the ve uh, veins will reach the heart in the posterior region and the blood will flow uh, to the ventricle which are and, uh, ventricles which are anteriorly and from there to the big arteries of the heart. Between these two territories, between the, the, the venous and the uh, arterious part of the heart, there we have the sinus transversus, then transverse sinus of the pericardium. You can put your finger into it and if you put your finger into it, then all the veins are behind your finger and all the arteries are in front of your finger. We are now on the fifth week, and on the fifth week already the pharyngeal arches form, also the lung primordium, lung bud, will protrude here. And parallelly uh, with the heart formation and the dorsal aorta formation, also the pharyngeal arches uh, will appear. Uh, from the pharyngeal arches, uh, the first and the second will mostly uh, disappear, the third will partially uh, remain, the fourth remains, had different fates on the two sides, you learned it with the arteries, there is no fifth, and there you have the sixth arch, and the sixth arch here you see this side branch, which is connecting already the lung, but uh, that will be the pulmonary artery. So these, uh, these uh, vessels, they can get close to each other. I mean the heart primordium and the dorsal aorta through that, that the uh, folding happens. And so the heart will get to the ventral side of the body and the outgrowing blood vessels uh, may connect to the dorsal aorta. Now, so now how do these, these body cavities get separated? A major a structure will be the septum transversum, which is a thick mesodermal tissue between the thoracic cavity and the stalk of the York sac. Right? That's the septum transversum, and that's the major analog for the diaphragma. Uh, if you think about uh, the liver development and the, the venous development, then you know also that the septum transversum has to do also with the connective tissue elements of the liver and the, uh, the, uh, the vital, vital line veins and the umbilical veins. They are uh, in the territory of the septum transversum and they will give the sinusoids of the liver. So the, the septum transversum has uh, not just one role, it has more roles also in the formation of the sinuses of the liver and the connective, other connective tissue elements of the liver. But still it's also a major uh, anlage for the diaphragma. Where does it form? Where does it form? Uh, where do we have our diaphragm now? So we have, now we have it between the lungs and the heart on one side and on the other side we have the liver and the stomach. Right, so the liver and the stomach, uh, these are uh, parts of the foregut, the, the most distal part of the foregut. And the most distal part of the foregut is at that point which is between the midgut and here this anterior blind territory. So this is here the, the lowest point of the foregut. And we have to be with, this, uh, with the diaphragma uh, 
under the heart and above the liver. Where does the liver form? I hope I, I will have this part here. So here does the liver form. That's the last structure which forms from the foregut. So if you imagine the position of the uh, septum transversum, it must be between the heart primordium and the liver primordium. From here, it will push backward, right? It push back, pushes backward, but it doesn't reach the posterior body wall. It will leave an opening here. With that, that, the body cavities in the upper region and in the lower region will be in contact with each other. Nowadays, this is called pericardioperitoneal canal. The former name uh, was pleuropericardioperitoneal canal. It made more sense because it tells you that in the above region, you will have the pleural cavity and the pericardial cavity, and in the lower region, you will have the peritoneal cavity. Uh, if we fi uh, figure out that where was this territory, this territory just before it start, uh, the deflection started, it's still in between the, uh, the mid-gut and the heart primordium. That means the edge of the trilaminar germ disc and the heart primordium. So that means it's on the very, very front of the uh, front, if we may call it like this, of the trilaminar germ disc before the folding. When the folding happens, then it will be opposite to the, uh, basically to the fourth cervical segment. Uh, why is this important? Because parallelly with all these this, uh, happenings, what I told you now, so we have the heart tube formation, we have the septum transversum formation, we have the folding, uh, but parallelly with all these happenings, also the segmentation started in the, in the paraxial mesoderm, and you know that the paraxial mesoderm will have the myotome, uh, uh, the sclerotome, and the dermatome cells. For us now, the myotome cells are most interesting. So these myotome cells in the fourth segment will be just opposite to the septum transversum. So the myotome cells will invade the septum transversum and we know that all skeletal muscle comes from the myotome cells. So we need the myotome cells in order to have muscle in the diaphragma. So we get the myotome cells mostly from the fourth, a little bit from the third and fifth uh, cervical segments. This also explains uh, the innervation of the diaphragm. You know that the, inner, the innervation comes from the phrenic nerve, and we have that uh, little verse in English that C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. So that's how you can know that uh, it comes from these uh, segments, also the myotome cells and also the innervation. Uh, so, uh, to turn back to this uh, territory, uh, then we see here the septum transversum uh, pushing from ventrally in the direction of the dorsal body wall, and we know that this wasn't closed perfectly. Above this territory, the heart will develop, and from the foregut, as you showed you already on the previous figure, the lung bud will start to grow out, then it divides, it does its di dichotomic uh, divisions, and the lung will develop here. Uh, this territory is the stalk of the York sac, so you see that the septum transversum is between the, uh, the uh, heart and the uh, stalk of the York sac, so this is in now in the territory of the thoracic cavity. Now, the lungs begin to expand uh, into the body wall, uh, mesenchyme, uh, in all directions, so it will go ventrally, laterally, and dorsally. With this, it will pull onto itself, onto the developing lung, one layer of the serous membrane in this region, and that we will call later the pleura. You see the formation of the aorta here. Now, at this stage, we already have just one aorta. Initially, for a short period, we have two dorsal aortas. Now they are already united. We have one aorta. And uh, we also have here uh, the, the, the rest of the foregut. Uh, now our job is to separate in above the, uh, the septum transversum to, how, uh, to understand how pleural cavity and pericardial cavity do get separated. Uh, to the heart, major big blood vessels will return, like, for example, the common cardinal vein ductus cuvieri, or common cardinal vein. 
As this vessel returns to the heart, it will pull in from the lateral blood body wall a plate, which we call the pleuropericardial plate. The name says that it will separate the pleural cavity from the pericardial uh, cavity. Uh, this plate will pull in, they, it gets closer and closer to each other. Finally, these two layers will here unite. With this, the uh, pericardial sac will get separated from the pleural cavities, but these two other plates will also unite, but not with each other, but with the visceral plate of the lungs. So we get two separate pleural sacs at this point. Uh, embedded into the pleuropericardial plate, there is also the uh, phrenic nerve. And if you remember the dissection of the uh, mediastinum, then you remember the, that the phrenic nerve was embedded into the fibrous layer of the pericardium. So actually it runs between the two fibrous layers of the pleura and the pericardium, just the fibrous layer of the pericardium is thicker and it has a closer relationship with that. So this is the final position. You, are, you may understand it from the developmental uh, history. And this was my first picture, a nice old picture about the development of the body cavities. And actually, as you see, it's the same as what we show you later. Here you see the lungs, here you see the pleural uh, pericardial uh, plate, and here you see the heart. That's the same uh, information as on that other picture. Okay. So... Uh, how does uh, then, how is then the, the formation of the diaphragma uh, completed? Uh, we have this uh, pleuropericardioperitoneal canal, which is yet open. From the posterior body wall, a half moon shape, crescent shaped uh, fold will uh, uh, grow in, and this is the pleuroperitoneal fold. The pleuroperitoneal fold that separates the, the final pleural cavity from the peritoneal cavity. We have here the esophagus. The esophagus is, uh, uh, that is this uh, uh, turkey's uh, oval territory now. The, it's embedded into the uh, dorsal mesenterium. And we have dorsally from that we have the aorta. And also close to here we have the inferior vena cava. So now we see that the body cavities are separated. They are separated uh, already at the end of the seventh week. And at this time point, it consists of the mesentery of the esophagus, the pleuroperitoneal folds, and the septum transversum. Uh, in the fourth month, end of third month, beginning fourth month, also mesenchyme from the thoracic wall, from the body wall, uh, will contribute to these uh, connective tissue ter territories. Uh, this is what explains that in the sensory innervation, only the sensory innervation, uh, the, also the intercostal nerves, uh, nerves will participate. Uh, as I told you at the beginning when the septum transversum starts to develop, it's opposite from the, of the fourth uh, cervical uh, uh, somite segment. Uh, but by the 10th week, it will be at the level of the first lumbar vertebra. Take care, this is the origin, not the projection of the uh, diaphragma onto the uh, anterior uh, body wall. Uh, right? So the origin of the diaphragm will be at the level of the, about at the level of the first lumbar vertebra. Uh, it descends, right? So it descends also the diaphragm and also the heart. All organs, think of it, all organs which are finally positioned above the diaphragm start to develop in the upper cervical region. So that means that the lungs, the heart, the thymus, uh, of course the larynx, the thyroid, and all these organs, these are uh, descending uh, from the cervical region. So. Uh, I have to tell you that I, uh, until about, uh, let's say, five, eight years ago, when the newest edition of, at that time, newest edition of the English Langban book uh, explained about the development of the uh, skeletal muscle uh, using the term patterning and explained what this, why is this patterning so important, I had always some problems with the, with the uh, development of the, of the diaphragm. Every year I checked on it that whether I can really understand it, that how it happened. 
happens. Uh, and at that time, I fo fo found a quote uh, that was 15 years ago about that uh, uh, I would be happy to give a pound to everyone who really understands the development of the diaphragm if in return I received a pound from everyone who has who was merely committed to the official description and those diagrams to memory, right? So it was not only me who had problems with it, but if you, if you know that, that uh, skeletal muscle, uh, all skeletal muscles are derived from the myotome cells, but they cannot differentiate properly without the patterning effect of the surrounding mesenchyme, then you can easily understand now the development of the diaphragm because these territories, which, we, which usually books list as, uh, as unlike for the diaphragm, these only give the connective tissues which give the patterning. So we have the, the mesentery of the esophagus, we have the septum transversum, we have the pleuroperitoneal membrane, we have the body wall. These are the mesenchymal territories which will give the patterning of the my to the myotomes which come from the cervical somites. Okay, so if a complicated system like this has to form, then of course we will have also sometimes problems. What may be these problems? We may have esophageal hernias. These esophageal hernias may, may uh, happen at those territories uh, where anywhere uh, some, some structure has to uh, trans, uh, go through the di uh, diaphragma or uh, at the territories where these special plates has to have to fuse with each other. So, so we may have a parasternal hernia. Uh, this is at the territory between the sternal and the costal part. And here the, uh, the uh, internal thoracic artery goes through and forms the superior epigastric artery. Uh, this is usually a smaller uh, hernia. It usually doesn't cause major problems. Uh, esophageal hernia, that's around the loop. Uh, that's in the territory of the loop which surrounds the cardiac region. Uh, this usually uh, is not a, a, a hernia which is a malformation at birth. Usually uh, because of the looseness of this loop, this happens later in life and it may uh, uh, cause serious uh, problems to the, uh, to the patients. Sometimes uh, if it's pinched in, then it may imitate the symptoms of a heart infarct. Uh, but a major problem is that if the, uh, if the uh, pleuropericardioperitoneal canal doesn't close uh, in, uh, in this posterior territory, this posterior territory, the remnant of it, you can see, see here at the lumbocostal triangle between the lumbar part and the costal part of the diaphragm. So if, you, if we see the posterior body wall dissected, then in this region we can see a little territory where, where, it's a connect, where there is a connective tissue plate only. Normally nothing uh, will uh, step through here, but if this doesn't close, then uh, the intestinal intestines of the baby, usually on the left side, 90% on the left side, they will be pushed up into the thoracic uh, uh, cavity and they will push all the organs in the thoracic cavity to the right. With this, they don't allow the development of the lung. Uh, if they wouldn't allow the development of the heart, and sure, surely that might be also a problem, then the baby wouldn't survive the intrauterine life because without circulation, couldn't survive. But it, if, if it allows the development of the heart, but it doesn't allow the development of the lungs, that means that uh, uh, when the baby is born, that's uh, not compatible with life because it doesn't have a functioning, uh, distendable uh, lung uh, tissue. Uh, scientists haven't agreed yet that which is the first order problem. Uh, it may be uh, that the, uh, the formation of the pleuroperitoneal fold is the, is, the, is the number one problem. And because of this, uh, then the diaphragm doesn't close and the intestines may herniate into the thoracic uh, cavity. Or on the other hand, it may be also that the lungs don't develop well and the lung stimulation, the, the, the normally growing lung would be needed uh, to close this opening. And uh, it may be also the problem. The end effect is the same. At the end, the baby doesn't have a functioning lung. Uh, heroic intervention is in this case in, if they uh, diagnose it with the ultrasound examination that in utero they close the trachea and with this they, they, uh, they keep the fluid which is, uh, which is uh, uh, 
produced by the lungs of the baby, they keep inside and with that they give some more space for lung development, but this is usually not, uh, not, uh, not a good uh, prognosis, this kind of, of uh, a malformation. Here you see a malformation of the same uh, problem. So the, the, the bowels and the stomach is in the thoracic cavity. Here you see a small lung. Uh, and on the other picture, that's a Röntgen, uh, an X-ray picture uh, from our university. It is at least 30 years old, might be older somewhat, uh, which was the exception. So in this case, the hernia happened on the right side. Right? It is, uh, the uh, the uh, end effect is the same, so the baby didn't survive because it didn't have a lung. So now, uh, we will, now I will show you some problems of the formation of the body wall. Uh, the body wall uh, forms and closes with the ventralization. So enough tissues have to be ventralized in order to form uh, the originally white connection between the midgut and uh, the, uh, the vital line sac. And uh, in the, you know that in the second month, uh, the, uh, the bowels of the forming midgut, they don't fit into the body, and we have a physiological umbilical hernia. Now, if uh, the, the body wall doesn't extend perfectly, then this may uh, remain. It, it may happen that the, the, the uh, bowels don't pull back to the body wall, and the baby is, for, is born with that omphalocele. Uh, in this case, these loops, these bowel loops, are covered by the amnion. And here you see the, uh, the amniotic cord. This is obviously an abortion baby, uh, but sometimes it may happen that, uh, that uh, babies, live babies, are born uh, with this problem. Another problem may be the gastroschisis. In this case, there is a true gap, usually on the right side of the umbilicus. Uh, there is a normal umbilicus, and the bowels are hanging into the uh, amniotic fluid. A difference between these two in the background is that, that the omphalocele is usually uh, combinated with, uh, with chromosomal defects, and the gastroschisis is not combinated with, with chromosomal uh, defects. In both cases, this is a serious problem uh, because, the, as you know, the amnion doesn't prevent evaporation, and these tissues may dry out here, and they may dry out even more in this case when the, uh, the bowels, which are just covered by the serous membrane, by the peritoneum, hang into the amniotic fluid. As long as in, they are in the amniotic fluid, they are fine uh, because there is fluid around them, but uh, uh, in the minute when these, are when these babies are born, uh, that's a major problem. That it has to be prevented from drying out and from infections. What they do, it's a very interesting method, that they, uh, they fix kind of like a tube onto the belly uh, of the, of the, on the belly button region of the baby, on, on, the, on the opening uh, open territory of the, of the abdominal body, uh, body wall, and they put uh, physiological salt onto it. So with, this, with the pressure of the fluid, they try to push back uh, the bowels into the abdominal wall, and if uh, they can distend it uh, so far that at least uh, partially it would accept the bowels and partially it could be replaced by some, uh, uh, some uh, artificial tissue, then the baby has some chances to survive, but this is also not a very good prognosis. So this is the problem of the closure of the abdominal uh, body wall. Uh, in the chest region, we may have also a problem like this, like ectopia cordis it is called. In this case, the heart is uh, uh, so the, the ster sternum has an opening, and through this sternal opening, the heart may hang into the amniotic fluid, like here, or it may be covered only by skin. Uh, it would be so simple, right? So we have one sternum, it's an unpaired bone, and you could think that it has one unlager, but it's not. It has two parallel uh, territories from which it develops. Here you see these two parallel territories. This is an adult chest. Uh, where, it, uh, it, it, where it was not united. But originally, when it develops, it, it has also two territories from which it has to grow together and unite in the midline. 
even uh, in, uh, when it ossifies, there are several ossification centers. So in the at the territory where, uh, where the ribs reach the sternum, for a while yet, there are uh, cartilaginous connections. Uh, they, 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 we have in the back we have the vertebrae, and sometimes these these units are referred uh, to as sternebrae because it had you have a piece of bone and a piece of cartilage, piece of bone, piece of cartilage. Now these cartilages normally they uh, disappear, but we have one left because between the manubrium and the body of the sternum you have a synchondrosis, so that's a permanent uh, synchondrosis, and also the xiphoid process remains more or less. Uh, cartilaginous, usually it ossifies fully only in uh, an older age. And also the two sides, the two symmetrical sides have to unite with each other uh, perfectly. If you go, if you have, would have the chance yet to go around in our dissecting rooms and in the boxes where we have the uh, vertebrae and the sternum, uh, we have a few sternum bones on which in the midline you have a hole. That's the, that's the defi deficiency of the uniting of these bones. If this is just a hole in the proper plane, then it doesn't make any uh, big problems. But unfortunately, sometimes uh, it makes a problem because with this uniting, uh, the chest may pull in. We call this pectus excavatum, funnel chest, dental chest, sunken chest. It has so many uh, synonyms in the English language. And you could think that, okay, this is a cosmetic problem. It doesn't look very good. But the problem is not that only, that it's cosmetically it doesn't uh, uh, look very good. It's also a problem uh, that this uh, indented chest, the indentation, makes a pressure onto the lungs and onto the heart. So with this, then the breathing and also the pulmonary circulation uh, may have a problem. So this is also a physiological problem. Because of this, it has to be operated. And uh, the operation is a very interesting operation. A, a beam of steel plate is uh, driven in on one side and driven out on the other side. And when it's inside the chest, and then this beam, this beam is folded anteriorly. And as it's folded anteriorly, with that they can push out uh, this indented territory. Sometimes they need even two beams to push it out perfectly. Uh, this would allow more space for the heart and lungs to function. And if those ribs, uh, which are fixed by this beam, cannot work, uh, cannot move, that's not that big of a problem. Uh, the rest of the uh, ribs can do yet the, the movements. <clears throat> the opposite to this uh, a malformation is the pectus carinatum, that's the pigeon chest or bird chest. In this case, uh, the, it's not, there is not an indentation, but it's pointed anteriorly uh, the un upon the uniting of these two uh, territories from which the, uh, the sternum forms. Uh, this is uh, usually of a lesser problem physiologically, but it may cause also breathing uh, and circulatory problems. And now we will briefly talk about the serous membranes. The ser about the serous membranes, you had an anatomy class, uh, and uh, you, you saw it also in the body. So basically, in the abdominal territory with the serous membranes, uh, we have the case that we have a tube, which is the bowel. Uh, it's covered by the, the visceral plate of the serous membrane. Many times it has a double plate connection to the parietal plate. In this double plate, the blood vessels may reach the bowel. So this is a, a very important thing that these, these uh, what sometimes we call them ligaments, sometimes we call them meso, whatever, like meso appendix, mesenterium, mesocolon. So these territories, they give a route for the vessels to reach the bowels. Uh, and uh, the serous membranes themselves, they originate from the lining of the intraembryonic cellulose. So on this picture, this is this, this inner black line, which is along this gray uh, territory. So this is here the visceral peritoneum, that's the parietal peritoneum. 
versus the peritoneum in the abdominal region we have uh, uh, several possibilities there are organs which have nothing to do with the peritoneum there are the so-called these are the so-called primary retroperitoneal organs then we have some organs which are pushed into the peritoneum so deeply that this double plate it tends to close behind them these we call intraperitoneal if we split on hair then actually we have practically nothing what is intraperitoneal because this is also outside the peritoneum just it's pushed in so far that this neck neck piece of peritoneum uh, can form and it allows the blood vessels to go, go to the uh, bowels then the third variation is that when Originally, all organs were intraperitoneal, but some organs uh, are sliding backward and they get connected again wider uh, with the, with the uh, body wall connective tissue. These are the so-called secondary retroperitoneal organs. Like, for example, on this picture here, you see a loop of the small intestine. It has um, the mesentery. So this would be here an intraperitoneal organ, but this is here the colon uh, ascendance, descendance, and these are secondary retroperitoneal organs. Uh, it's also interesting to follow the position of the of the uh, intestinal tract versus the peritoneum, because it, uh, if it's uh, secondary retroperitoneal, it's better fixed. So it gives a better fixation to that organ. If it's intraperitoneal, then it gives, uh, then it allows more movement, and this varies very uh, nicely through the uh, through the. Uh, entire uh, tube system. So the stomach uh, that's intraperitoneal, but a big part of the duodenum is retroperitoneal, then the last of the small intestine is intraperitoneal, the colon ascendens is retroperitoneal, colon transversum is intraperitoneal, colon transversum again retroperitoneal, colon sigmoideum intraperitoneal, and the rectum is retro and infraperitoneal. So one part is retroperitoneal, always the next is intraperitoneal, and with this then the bowels can move relatively freely in the abdominal cavity. Yeah, so we have a ventral mesenterium and a dorsal mesenterium. It's uh, usually it's described so that the ventral mesenterium uh, that's uh, standing there empty and waiting the development of the liver, but uh, it's the opposite way around. So there is there is no ventral mesenterium. It's the liver bud which pulls down for itself this ventral mesenterium. At the end, we have a ventral mesenterium. So what comes from this territory, uh, what originates from this territory, which is between the stomach and the liver, that will be the uh, lesser omentum. So the lesser omentum develops from a part of this ventral uh, mesentery. Uh, those territories which are connected to the greater curvature of the stomach, here we have many, many uh, pieces, what we call with different ligaments, but keep in mind that these are continuous with each other, so there is no border and they smoothly go, one goes into the, uh, one continues into the other. Uh, so from the uh, greater curvature uh, fundus region, the gastrophrenic ligament connects to the, uh, to the uh, Diaphragma, actually, this is a double plate of peritoneum which that reaches the parietal peritoneum at the diaphragma level. Then there is a plate between the, uh, the stomach and the liver, that's the gastrosplenic ligament, and another plate, the gastrophrenic, uh, lig uh, the, the, the phrenicosplenic ligament that connects to the uh, diaphragma. And these two ligaments downward, they hang down and form the greater omentum, which is a huge sac. Uh, it's a, a very uh, large territory which is uh, uh, hanging uh, uh, the four plates of peritoneum and it covers these plates that cover the intestine uh, between the body wall and the intestines. Uh, behind the stomach we have the bursa omentalis, the lesser sac, and a secondary retroperitoneal organ is also the, uh, the uh, pancreas. Where, what do we have there in the retroperitoneum? There we have the, uh, the splenic artery, which, is, which runs retroperitoneally. And from the retroperitoneum, it can reach the spleen through the phrenicosplenic ligament. And it reaches the, uh, the spleen at the helum and also to this helum territory. 
the gastrosplenic uh, ligament will connect. And this gastrosplenic ligament allows that from the splenic artery, we have the, the short gastric arteries and we have the left gastroepiploic artery. So they will go to, through these connections uh, to the uh, greater curvature territory. How does this uh, uh, omentomyus form? So from the, uh, originally we had an intraperitoneal stomach and originally it had this ventral mesenterium which was connected to the liver and let's say a short, which is not that short already in this picture, a short uh, dorsal mesentery. Now imagine that I'm pull, pushing my finger into this territory like this arrow shows and I'm pushing it, pushing it down. What happens? Then from the greater curvature two plates will run down, two plates will go back and two plates reach the posterior body wall. Secondarily, it will, these posterior two plates will grow together with the colon transversum. And secondarily, they will reach the, the uh, posterior body wall together with the, mes uh, with the mesocolon transversum. But that's already a secondary structure that they fuse together there. Uh, okay, so this is how the greater omentum uh, will form. Uh, Men are perfect, all men know this, all women know this, but only from one point of view, uh, that they have a per perfect peritoneal sac, there are no holes on it. Uh, women, they must have holes on the peritoneal sac, on the, on the, and uh, in women we have really structures which look really into the cavity of the peritoneum, and these will be the two ovaries, Right? You know that, you have the, uh, that in women there, are the, there is the free border of the ovary. The free border of the ovary looks into the true peritoneal cavity. And because the ovulation happens there, then also the uterine tubes will have to look into this peritoneal cavity. Otherwise, the egg cell wouldn't get into the uterine tube. So the, both uterine tubes open freely into the peritoneal cavity and both ovarian, ovarian surfaces where the ovulation happens, this free surface, that also looks into the peritoneal cavity. I used to tell it, of course this is a joke, that if you would let an ant into the uh, vagina of a female, it could climb up through the cervix, through the cavity of the uterus, through the uterine tube, and could walk around in the true peritoneal cavity. Right? The sperm cells do this, uh, the same story uh, sometimes. Okay. Uh, how can we get access to the, uh, to the uh, Bursa Mentalis? I wanted to yet tell you this. Uh, through the uh, mesocolon transversum or the, through the gastrocolic uh, ligament. The gastrocolic ligament is actually this uppermost region of the uh, omentum maius. Uh, previously, uh, through, the, uh, through the epiploic foramen, there was no possibility to get close to the, uh, to the pancreas. Uh, nowadays, with the uh, with the help of, of uh, endoscopic techniques, this is also possible. The peritoneal cavity has uh, pouches, uh, and these pouches may be sometimes important. Sometimes we have to control whether in these pouches there is fluid or not. Uh, it may be uh, the, the recto vesicle pouch or the recto uterine pouch in the lesser pervis, that's one territory. That has had always an importance because it can be palpated uh, either through the rectum or through the vagina. So that was already long known that here fluid can, can, uh, can, col can get collected and it was also, uh, there was the possibility to have it diagnosed. But uh, there, this pouch, which is behind the liver, where the parietal plate of the peritoneum will go over to the coronary ligament of the liver, that's also a territory here, uh, the hepatorenal pouch. Uh, in, uh, uh, this is also a territory where a doctor may see fluid. For seeing the fluid, of course, the fluids will flow downward, so it has to be always close to the uh, deepest point of, of uh, the actual position of the body. Right? In the Trendelenburg position, this territory was palpable, but this territory was not palpable because it's behind the ribs, but nowadays on CT and MR pictures, it's, it's, uh, it's possible to see it. Right? So it get, got more importance now with the today's diagnostic methods to check the hepatorenal pouch for possible fluids in certain cases. 
Also, the peritoneal cavity gives the, the, the possibility for peritoneal dialysis. So the peritoneal dialysis uh, may be a help for patients who, have, who don't have access to, uh, to uh, dialysis centers, so they can do this, al uh, not alone, with, probably with the help of someone, uh, that uh, they will uh, let the solution, the dialysing solution, into the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneum functions as a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, it will stay inside for a while, and then it can get, can, can get drained. This can be done also during night, and may be a possible uh, therapeutic, therapeutic method for those patients who have uh, kidney problems. Well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>